Um, so, oops. So welcome to the annual Rabin and Brill Holocaust Lecture. It's hosted by the Michael and Elaine Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel here at MSU. And I'm Professor Amy Simon. I am the Endowed Chair, William and Audrey Farber Family Endowed Chair in Holocaust Studies and European Jewish History here at MSU. I teach in the James Madison College and in the Department of History. And I wanted to say a few things about the Jewish Studies Institute and then of course, uh, introduce our illustrious speaker here today. So first of all, um, the Michael and Lane Serling Institute for Jewish Studies is enormously active. And of course, we're getting towards the end of the semester and toward the end of our programming for the year. But um, many of you are familiar with our program and know that we have events almost every week throughout the academic year. Um, so, you know, keep checking back uh, on the website and checking back. I know that, you know, emails go out at the end of the summer, kind of letting everybody know what's going on. Uh, and the last major event that we're having uh, tomorrow is our undergraduate research conference. And so this is an amazing event where we get to invite Jewish studies minors and other students who've written uh, really amazing research for, uh, you know, at the undergraduate level on all areas of Jewish studies. It starts at 830 tomorrow. It goes all day long and you can attend some or or you know, all or only some of the events, um, but I highly recommend checking out what some of our students have been doing. Um, so that's tomorrow. And also for those of you who are students who are here, who are in the process of registering for next year for classes, we do have a lot of Jewish studies classes um, and particularly related to the Holocaust for those of you interested uh, in this particular topic. Um, so in the fall, we have MC 387, which is a Jews and anti-Semitism class. And in the spring, we'll have the Holocaust history class. And um, I hope you can't hear, there's some noise outside of my house. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, a Holocaust history class and a, um, in the history department and also a European Jewish history class in the history department. And I will also be teaching a senior seminar in the James Madison College on the Holocaust in American memory. So uh, keep, those mind, those classes are open and count for JMC majors and history majors and also for Jewish studies minors. And if you have trouble getting into them, let us know because as a Jewish studies minor, you are um, welcome to be in all of those classes. So definitely keep those in mind. And I think in the chat, there's some information about the classes and the Jewish studies website. Um, so in particular for this event, which we get to do every year, it's just an enormous pleasure to have the opportunity to invite just really important groundbreaking scholars in the area of Holocaust studies to, to be here at MSU, whether virtually or in real life. Um, and so I wanna thank all of our co-sponsors today. Uh, we have a lot of co-sponsors within MSU. So the College of Arts and Letters, JMC, James Madison College, College of Social Science, ARCA, the Office for Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives, the Department of History, Peace and Justice Studies, and the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies. Uh, but in particular, I also want to thank the families who endow this and make this lecture possible every single year. And so two major families, the Rabin and Brill families and two major endowments, the David and Sarah Rabin Endowment Fund and the Michael D. Brill and Leslie Van Brandt Endowment Fund. And so I'll tell you a little bit about these funds and then I'll introduce our speaker. So the Sarah and, uh, David and Sarah Rabin Endowment Fund, uh, this memorial lecture fund was established by Professor Albert Rabin who came to MSU in 1948 and uh, retired in 1982. He provided 34 years of service through teaching and research in psychology. And Dr. Rabin established the endowment to commemorate the Holocaust in the memory of his parents, David and Sarah Rabin. And in Edward Brill for the uh, Michael D. Brill and Leslie Van Brand Endowment Fund established the Michael D. Brill Endowment Fund to support teaching and research about the Holocaust and to honor the memory of his brother. Michael was not able to attend college himself, but he spent his life devoted to Judaism and learning about history, especially the Holocaust. So it is my pleasure again for us to be able to come together and continue learning about the Holocaust. And so I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Deanna Dimitru is an associate professor of history at Yuan Kranga State University of Moldova. Her field of research includes the Holocaust in Europe, nationalism, and Jews under late Stalinism. 
Dr. Demetrio has held multiple fellowships really all over the world. We were just talking about how exciting uh, her, her research and her travels are and have been. Um, so she has had a Fulbright Visiting Scholarship at Georgetown University, the Goethe Henkel Stiftung Fellowship in Germany, the Simone Wiesenthal Institute Visiting Researcher in Austria, and the Rosenzweig Family Fellowship for Research at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. She's author, authored over 40 academic articles and two books. Her second book, The State, Anti-Semitism and Collaboration in the Holocaust, The Borderlands of Romania and the Soviet Union, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. And together, she has two major projects ongoing. Together with Chad Bryant and Katerina Kapova, she is currently working on a book titled The Trial That Shook the World, The Slansky Process and the Dynamics of Czechoslovak Stalinism, which is a project supported by the American Council of Learned Societies. She is also writing a single author book focused on Jewish life and the rise of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union after World War II. And in addition to all of this research, she is also an editorial board member of the scholarly journals, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, East European Jewish Affairs, and the Journal of Genocide Research. She is also a member of the advisory board of the EU funded European Holocaust Infrastructure. So it is my honor to welcome such a distinguished professor and scholar to present her work to us. And she will be presenting today her work on Neighbors in Difficult Times, Jews and Gentiles in the Borderlands of the Soviet Union and Romania during the Holocaust. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for this very kind and generous introduction. And uh, good afternoon to everybody from wherever you are watching this. And uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be delivering this fifth annual David and Sarah Rabin, a Michael Grill lecture on the Holocaust that's hosted by Michigan State University. And uh, I'd like to thank Professor Amy Simon, the Parker Family Chair in Holocaust Studies and uh, European Jewish History for this outstanding opportunity. Uh, I also just want to use this um, occasion to say thank you to so many colleagues in so many places in different countries for uh, sharing ideas, like testing some of the hypotheses that I, I worked with during this like long project. I've been working on this project for about like 10 years a time. So what you'll hear today in this about like 15 minutes or so, uh, I, it's actually a project that it's comprised, uh, a, pro a 10 years project comprised in 15 minutes. So please bear with me. Um, and also I would like to use the opportunity to say thank you to many of the Holocaust survivors who shared so generously their stories, their life stories that also made this project possible. So my plan is to uh, start a PowerPoint presentation that I prepared for today. And uh, hopefully I could share my screen with you. And you can see uh, um, my screen. So uh, hopefully it works. And um, what I want to explain is that today I will be talking about the civilian population's attitude towards Jews in a specific area of Eastern Europe. And I'll be talking today frequently about Transnistria and Bessarabia. And some of you maybe are not familiar with the area. So in, in a minute or so, I'll show you the map um, just to locate everything on the, on the map. But now I want to um, say, I want to start with the um, statement that in addition to the main factor that caused this man-made catastrophe, the Nazi regimes and its allies that basically uh, masterminded the Holocaust, the way civilian population behaved towards Jews was a separate factor. And this factor, while not decisive uh, for the survival of, of Jews, it was still an important factor for individual Jewish uh, people and, and this intervention of civilians could help somebody to survive or could decide uh, somebody could end somebody's life. So in my project, I focus exactly on the interaction between civilian Gentiles and, and Jews in the Eastern Europe. And I compare two regions. I compare um, Bessarabia with Transnistria. And I also uh, try to um, see and, and show you, hopefully I can show you the differences, 
uh, between these attitudes in these two territories. I want to explain like what kind of differences were there and why. And also I want to make the argument based on the findings that I, I discovered in my research that actually states have in their arsenal powerful tools for um, constructing either animosity between ethnic groups or constructing solidarity. And in my next slide, I have like two quotations. Here is one quotation a Jewish survivor said about his experience in Transnistria. I encountered extraordinary people. Ukrainians helped me to survive in the camp. Another Jewish survivor talked about his experience in Bessarabia and said that the Moldovans were the people who helped the Germans. They burned the houses and people. The Moldovans were worse than SS. So these are two quotations that I think are representative of my research. This message would come up systematically throughout my research. And I'm not trying to say that all population, the entire population in one area behaved in one way, or the other population in Bessarabia behaved in a different way. Of course, individuals behaved in, in multiple ways. But what I'm trying to say that my sources show a pattern. And in this um, talk, I will use my quotations basically to illustrate the patterns that I've seen in my study. And uh, uh, here is um, the area that I will be talking about. Here's the map of Europe. And with red color, you see uh, the, my case study. So the uh, case study comes from the modern day territory of Moldova and it's a part of Ukraine. So I will do a close up uh, study and, and so that you see the map uh, closely. It's a map from 1941, 1944. This is the period when Romania was controlling these two areas. So again, you see Bessarabia and you see Transnistria. And between the two areas, you see the, this is the river Dnester that I would be referring today uh, quite frequently. And um, if needed, I'll, I'll try to flip uh, back and forth so that you can see the map uh, more frequently. I, call, I chose these two territories uh, because of a particular reason. It, it wasn't randomly why I chose these regions and why I compare them. I believe that they present a unique case that I call a so-called natural experiment. This is a, a historian's delight, this kind of natural experiment. And so why um, do they offer um, a possibility to, to study this natural experiment? Um, first of all, for over a century, Bessarabia and Transnistria during 19th century, they were part of Tsarist Russia. They were part of Pale of Settlement, the infamous Pale of Settlement. So they were the borderland of Tsarist Russia. Uh, they had a comparable um, presence of Jews. Uh, here you see on my slide, I'm saying that about between 11 and 12 percent Jews were in Bessarabia and Transnistria. So they're very similar in sense of occupation of the population demography, the very similar, of course, in sense of um, how widely spread was anti-Semitism. And needless to say, they, of course, experienced the same state policies, state discrimination and anti-Semitism, because they were part of the same state. And I, uh, to give you clues about anti-Semitism, I made some reference to the infamous Kitchener program from 1903. Uh, Odessa, which was the biggest city in Transnistria, you can see it here on the map. Balta was another site of a pogrom in 1882 in Transnistria, and Shargorod, another Transnistrian town. But what is happening uh, during the interwar era, uh, this is when the difference is stepping in historically, because Transnistria becomes part of the Soviet state, and Bessarabia becomes part of Greater Romania. So uh, in sense of my interest, the attitude toward Jews, I see that the states start to implement completely different policies. Well, 
Yeah, if we're talking about Romania, the policy was not that different from the previous policy of Tsarist Russia, in the sense that anti-Semitism flourished and uh, maybe it was um, adjusted to the local demands, to the local Romanian uh, national building project. Uh, so in this sense, it was um, updated, uh, an updated form of anti-Semitism. And I'll be happy to give you more details and talk more like, um, in details during the Q&A session. Meanwhile, in Transnistria, the Soviet state tried to fight anti-Semitism and tried to um, integrate physically Jews and also um, implemented a plethora of uh, measures uh, that were exactly um, oriented towards this um, fighting of anti-Semitism. Now, many of you may wonder like, what? what am I talking about? Like the Soviet state with this kind of policies, because I bet a lot of you maybe know about the Stalinist uh, doctor's plot. Uh, of course, like a lot of people know about the Fusniks and, and uh, really uh, hostile attitude of the Soviet state uh, after World War II. But what I want to point is that the 1920s and 1930s were very different in sense of like Soviet state's attitude towards the Jewish question. And uh, the situation really changed after World War II, which is actually, yeah, as Emmy said, it's my new project. Then in 1941, both territories, I skipped this 1940 year when the Soviet Union uh, annexed Bessarabia and going to 1941, when both territories, Bessarabia and Transnistria are um, controlled by Romania or uh, come under the control of Romania, which was a Nazi ally. And then uh, um, the Holocaust started in full blow. Uh, I, I want to point to my uh, sources for this research, just in case you wonder like, what are my sources? What I'm basing on my findings? So I worked with a big group of survivors' testimonies, both audio or video. Uh, many of them uh, located at Yad Vashem, some of them at the Institute for Visual History and Education. Um, of course, I were used widely archival material from Romania, Moldova, Ukraine, Germany. Uh, I also sent a questionnaire uh, to uh, Holocaust survivors with the help of United States Holocaust uh, Memory uh, Museum because they uh, had this uh, registry that allowed me to access. And I received actually 60 responses from survivors. And then also to get the point of view of Gentiles, I also used over 200 interviews with non-Jews, both from Moldova and Ukraine. So, and now what I'll do in my presentation, I'll go briefly, uh, I'll offer you some kind of a, a summary of the Holocaust in Romania so that I'll be able to uh, properly um, place my findings in the Holocaust in Romania. So what's happening after 41, when uh, Transnistria and Besrebe come under the control of Romania is that in, June, July, 1941, Romanian army and police massacre a part of Jews of Bessarabia. And I'll go to the slide with the map so it will be easier for you to follow. So basically in most of the uh, rural area, the Romanian authorities massacre the Jews immediately. And then in bigger sites, uh, Jews are interned in temporary uh, transit ghettos. They're kept closed. And in the fall of 1941, uh, they marched by foot to Transnistria. They have to cross the river Dnestr. And then they kept in uh, sites in Transnistria and in camps and sometimes in pig styes and barns and open field camps and ghettos uh, in Transnistria until 1944. And exactly the same is the fate of Jews of Transnistria. Massacres, the ones who survive are deported uh, internally inside Transnistria and then uh, uh, freed in the spring of 1944 by uh, the Soviet army. 
Uh, I will show you a couple of photographs so that to illustrate this process of um, um, deportation and ghettoization. So here is a photograph of best Arabian Jews waiting to be deported to Transnistria. If you look at the people's faces, you see that some of the people have blood on their faces, uh, clearly uh, being um, physically abused during this process of being gathered and deported. So another photograph depicts like Jewish women and children in a best Arabian transit camp prior to deportation to Transnistria. Another photograph, uh, you see a column of uh, uh, Jews under the uh, guardian of, this is a Romanian soldier. You see he's chasing an elderly man that carries a sack. So you see like all the people, children uh, marching. Sometimes they would march for tens of kilometers per day. And you also see two German soldiers, but they were, Germans were not the one in charge with the Holocaust in this area, although they were also part as Einsatzgruppen in the Holocaust in West Rep and Transnistria. One more photograph to illustrate how Jews were ferried across the Dniester River. And um, uh, what I want to talk in a greater detail is the so-called litmus test that many of my colleagues uh, speak about or wrote about, the so-called litmus test of collaboration of how civilians behave in the summer of 1941 when a Nazi uh, Germany and its allies like stepped into many countries. So I think the key finding of my uh, research is uh, it's a very curious finding that in Bess Arabia, I found a number of programs where groups of civilians, especially peasants, of course, men, or all of them, almost exclusively men, uh, participated in the programs against the Jews. And here I have just a number, like, names of such towns like Skurica, Dumbraven, Girovo, Sasen, Pepin, Marianovka, Sus, Chepelewutz, Lublin. At the same time in Transnistria, all sources put together show that not a single pogrom occurred in this area. Uh, of course, uh, Jewish survivors and, and sources talk about uh, abuse and uh, mistreatment by local policemen and general individuals, but no pogroms with groups of people uh, assaulting local Jewry uh, came into my attention or is uh, registered in sources. So what I want to do, maybe I will exit the PowerPoint briefly and then I'll be back because I want to read you some testimonies uh, I want to describe just one pogrom. You see the, the Pepin one? Um, so that uh, will give you more understanding of how this was happening. So in Pepin, uh, um, over 200 in the center of the town, so the Pepin, it was just one uh, gendarme, chief gendarme, Romanian gendarmes, with two uh, of regular gendarmes. So uh, they locked local Jews. And it just happened that the Romanian and, and Soviet army was preparing a counterattack. And then the rumors spread that the Soviet army is going to arrive to the uh, village or town and it's going to free all the prisoners. In this situation, uh, a Romanian chief gendarme decided that he doesn't have sufficient manpower to slaughter all Jews. So he appealed to the local come and help uh, massacre all the prisoners. So I will be reading from um, um, post-war trial materials because after the Soviet authorities returned to the town, they arrested uh, um, a number, a significant number of participants because over 20 people like participated to this massacre. And so I have some of the depositions of the people who participated to this massacre. They explained that initially, uh, the Romanian gendarmes threw a grenade inside the building that they also 
beautiful shot through the windows from the outside towards was was bats was shovels was a lot of agricultural tools and, and um, basically killed whoever they could meet. So here is the deposition of the defendant named Ivan Satove. He said, after the shooting stopped outside and while the moans of people who were not dead yet could still be heard, I entered the building uh, with a club in my hands and it saw a horrible image. People who were alive were hiding behind the dead ones, hoping to save their lives, but they did not manage to do this. I personally killed 15 people inside the house itself with my club. I beat them so much that the club was dripping with blood. Afterwards, I turned over the dead, searching for the living among them. Then he also named other villagers who participated to the same massacre. And he also described their participation in the massacre. So this is what he explained. We were all armed with strong clubs with which you could easily kill a person. Equally, each of us took part in trying to make it impossible for the Jews to escape. While the shooting was going on, we used bats to kill anyone trying to escape through the window. There were times when the defenseless victims rushing from one side to the other, headed to where they jumped back. However, if they succeeded, then our blows simply made them squeeze back into the room where they were finished off. I personally hit a Jew in the head with this, uh, when he stuck it out the window and tried to run. I killed him with one strike. Besides guarding the building outside, the persons I have indicated were inside the building and killed the Jews with clubs. Meanwhile, some were armed with guns. Then they shot the Jews point blank, such as Mustafa Georgi, who shot Jews with a gun. Another defendant also added one more seen to this narrative of slaughter. So this is what he, uh, I entered the room where the women were kept. So presumably women and men were kept separately inside the building. And there was the girl, Kogan Frida, laying beside the door, missing a leg and covered in blood. Probably she was injured from the explosion of the grenade. I often went with her to get wine and other products to sell at her father's shop. When I worked for her father, Kogan Chuchila, Frida noticed me and she started to offer me her watch, gold ring, and 100 Soviet rubles and was begging me to shoot her because she did not want to be killed with a club and did not want to suffer anymore. From the smell of blood and just in general, the heavy air inside, I felt sick. Uh, I now will go back to sharing uh, my PowerPoint again. Um, and um, I will briefly mention that in many other locations, in many other programs, uh, similarly gruesome stories um, um, described. Like for example, in Dubravin, where a survivor said that the Moldovans took axes, pitchforks, metal bars, and went to kill and rob the Jews. Somebody named Frank Elifim said that the Moldovans started to take everything, started to rape, to beat. They chopped off the head of a Jew as a scythe. Somebody told us how Moldovans from his village raped a teenage girl just in front of him and his family, and that the girl was his girlfriend. Now, the story of plunder of Jewish household as individuals, which is just a bullet point in my presentation, can be the subject of books because it was so rampant, so widespread, uh, that is a lot to, to talk about. And unfortunately, I cannot like say too much here because time is too short. And only rarely people showed compassion and offered help to their Jewish neighbor. Here is a photograph that I decided to choose for my book cover uh, because it, it shows many things are happening on this photograph. But one uh, telling detail is that the person in white shirt is a principal of a local elementary school. And he has a gun and he's the one who helps uh, Romanian authorities to uh, 
chase and deport local Jews from Bejeva. And um, the sources also tell us ugly stories of uh, assault and abuse encountered during the process of deportation itself. So meaning not during the first, only during the first days of the arrival of Romanian authorities, but also during the deportations. Uh, stories like this that I present in my slide when a survivor told us that you go through the village on both sides a standing local inhabitants with long sticks and they hit whoever they can reach. My father was also bit severely. Uh, then, uh, uh, importantly, both Jews, but also non-Jews, testified about the sordid um, uh, type of uh, buying out well-dressed Jews from the gendarmes. When locals would buy them and they will kill them and, and plunder from all their belongings and stuff that would carry. Uh, and then also a survivor, uh, in this case, actually a Moldovan told us how villagers from Domintin robbed Jewish deportees during their rest break in their village, how two villagers pulled out the golden teeth of victims. These kind of stories are not exceptions. And as I said before, they are meant to show uh, some kind of trends and they meant to um, illustrate the type of violence and abuse committed in this area. And again, I want to share a photograph so that you could see uh, who were these people and how they looked, the victims. Uh, then in Transnistria, what I saw in Transnistria was, uh, um, I'm saying that I found for Transnistria, when speaking about the attitude of the Gentile population, uh, an unexpected image of rural Transnistria. Here, uh, survivors said that among the most important characteristics of the local population of local Gentiles is that they were helping survivors with food. And here is one quotation. Certainly, this support was very important. And with it, without it, I cannot even imagine how we would have survived would have died because of hunger, that's it. And it's very important to understand that between 1941 and 1944, the uh, Jews were confined in these spaces. They were not allowed to get out and they were basically uh, meant to be starved to death. And only with the help of the locals surrounding them, they managed to survive. And uh, a lot of, survivors were children at the time. And for example, Teper Itzhak was 11 at the time. So he said, we had no means of subsistence. What could the children would do? Get under the barbed wire and walk to nearby houses and bed. Uh, there were a number of cases of Jewish children being adopted by locals. We don't have the exact numbers, but the, the historian, the Israeli historian, Jean and Chichel, he said that we could be speaking of hundreds, but we could be speaking about like thousands of them because even Romanian counterintelligence noticed that this is a phenomenon in Transnistria and asked Romanian authorities to find this uh, Jewish children that were adopted and to bring them back where they supposed to be. And barter and work as sources of survival were frequently offered to um, um, Jews imprisoned in Transnistria. Now, of course, a question that was frequently encountered and the uh, important question to be responded to is like, would local Gentiles of Transnistria know that they were dealing with Jews when helping out? And here's a photograph that is kind of a response to this question because uh, when an interviewer asked a Jewish survivor named Alexander Sipino, he said like, what a question. Of course, it was impossible to hide it because this is how a Jewish child would look compared to the locals. He said like, it, you, even if you tried to lie, nobody would believe you because they understood immediately just by looking at you and seeing in what condition you are, they would understand that you just escaped from a camp or a ghetto. So um, I um, want to um, emphasize that uh, 
both situational factors, but also the social fabric function together simultaneously. One cannot discount situational factors such as fear because fear was real and omnipresent, both in Bessarabia and Transnistria. So uh, when survivors talk about escaping from camps, they say that escaping from the camp was probably the easiest part. The most difficult part was to find shelter because locals, even though they were compassionate, they would not take anybody in their house because they were afraid and that was the reality. And then compassion was a motivating factor, but material gain, it was another motivating factor sometimes. There were interesting cases in Transnistria where almost the entire village knew about their um, uh, hiding of fugitive Jews, but kept it secret from the Romanian authorities. I want to check my time to see how I'm doing. And um, uh, evidence of strong connections between former classmates existed uh, in Transnistria. We're talking about Transnistria still bringing food and medicines to camps, to ghettos, sheltering school friends, helping friends to escape during action. All these were actions described in my sources. And another curious uh, um, finding is that Jewish survivors from Transnistria were of the impression that youth was probably the most trustworthy social group at the, same, at the time of the Holocaust. And this is the one example, one quotation that illustrates this opinion that in that time, all our use was patriotic. So uh, I also, um, in addition to this uh, very descriptive uh, evidence that I presented to you, I also did some uh, quantitative analysis of my sources. And uh, here I am presenting a graph. Uh, in this graph, a random sample of 50 survivors' testimonies were coded for interactions between Jews and Gentiles. So in blue color, you see here the interactions on the territory of Bessarabia, or here in the graph it says interwar Romania. In red color, you see interaction between uh, Jews and Gentiles in the territory of Transnistria, in former Soviet Union. And uh, you see that below here, it, the graph is like from minus four to plus four. So I basically combed through these survivors' testimonies and coded each interaction. Uh, if somebody mentioned, for example, that the person was uh, rhetorically insulted or, you know, cursed, uh, or, or somebody actually mm, was compassionate uh, in rhetorically, or uh, if somebody was plundered or, you know, assaulted, bitten, or if somebody saw uh, an act of killing, all of this would be coded. So from the worst encounter to the best encounter, when somebody would uh, basically risk their life to, to save a Jewish individual, or you know, providing food, and also, for example, risking one's life to go to ghettos and camps to, to deliver food or medicine. So the interesting finding here that is it's visible from this graph is that uh, two important trends. The population from Bessarabia, you see the blue one, you see where it's located, uh, on, mostly on the minus part of the graph, was more likely to commit conflictual acts compared to the population of Transnistria, which was more, far more likely to have committed cooperative acts uh, compared to Bessarabian population. And uh, of course, these are the differences, but then why? <laughs> Somebody needs to explain the differences. And here I uh, will move on to the interwar era because um, my explanation is that the roots to these differences uh, should be located in the interwar period. And here I have a couple of images that 
I meant to illustrate to you the fact that in interwar Romania, a state that acquired in, and was happy to say that finally it collected all its historical territories, uh, acquired a lot of ethnic minorities from uh, former uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and from Russian Empire. Now, many of these ethnic minorities were more modern, more urban, and more educated than ethnic Romanian. And uh, the Romanian elites uh, and Romanian statesmen and intellectual elites, they embarked on this modernization project that was uh, nationalistic and that was meant to advance uh, ethnic Romanians as the elites, the country of elites. Now, it was, it was very difficult to deal with this um, minorities that I just mentioned from previous empires, like Germans, Hungarians, Russians, Jews. So it was very difficult to uh, absorb these minorities. So the state um, in time grew more and more intolerant and was trying to look for different type of solution of so-called purification of its society and its land. Uh, and embraced various forms of um, purification, including exchange of population, expulsion of population, and the worst of it, the Holocaust. And this um, hatred towards um, ethnic minorities, especially some of them, uh, was really expressed through the hatred towards Jews because the Jews became the archetype of the foreigner in Romania. And so uh, intellectuals, uh, political elites, um, all united in their anti-Semitic feelings. And uh, uh, they were coaching also peasants in uh, uh, Eating Jews, especially for the uh, uh, economical reasons, basically channeling a lot of tensions that were existing in Romanian society towards this like, ethnic hatred. Here is just like one caricature that is uh, meant to be illustrative of this uh, particular uh, trend. Here you see the representation of a group of Romanian peasants carrying sacks with corn and presumably the uh, fat person, a Jewish individual is asking like, why are you taking this corn? And the response is that we're taking it to sell and buy a couple of matches, uh, boxes of matches. And uh, uh, because I mentioned that uh, all elites were also supportive of uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism was a central element of this nation building project. Here are a couple of uh, quotations uh, one comes from a reputable uh, Romanian historian, Nicolae Iorga, who said that they, the Jews, are raising our churches, taking over our shops, occupying our jobs. And another uh, very renowned professor of biochemistry and physiology at Bucharest University, he said, was wondering, can we perhaps exterminate them the way bed bugs are killed? That would be the simplest, easiest, and fastest way to get rid of them. Uh, then uh, anti-Semitic parties like Iron Guard and Kuzist, they were functioning freely, they were uh, uh, propagating anti-Semitism and they gained ground in 1937 general elections and the Jews and their property were attacked with impunity uh, increasingly throughout the 1920s and, and even more in 1930s. And through the entire period, this despite the fact that 1923 constitution uh, recognized their rights, they remain second class subjects and there were a gradual exclusion of Jews from economic and political life of the country was the rule in Romania. Here, uh, again, a photograph from Kishno 1940. And uh, I want to stress once again that schools, universities, army, in Romania, where environments where anti jewish use could be openly displayed and cultivated. And in this sense, when we talk about interwar state policies in Transnistria, 
the situation was radically different because uh, first of all, the um, Soviet states uh, implemented equal rights for Jews and non-Jews. And here is important, of course, to say that, you know, the Soviet state was not the champion on uh, rights. But what I'm trying to say is whatever limited rights were available to other ethnic groups, um, non-Jewish, were also available to Jews. And importantly, anti-Semitism was punished by law. And in Ukraine, in the area of my study, for example, even the word uh, Jid, which in Ukrainian was might be okay, was banned because of very uh, strong association with the Russian word Jid, which is derogatory term, and they were forced uh, to use just Ivray, which was the right word. Then, interestingly, what I discovered was the state fought negative stereotypes and at the same time was trying to build positive images of Jews through literature, film, the press, and the art. And here, I mean, um, I was surprised to discover how much effort went into, for example, um, mm, creating movies, about like 40 silent movies were created on Jewish topics about them being victims of the civil war, of the pogroms, or how blood libel was spread against Jews on many issues. Uh, or for example, how authorities were trying to organize so-called excursions into Jewish uh, collective farms for Gentile peasants in order for Gentile peasants to be convinced that whenever Jews are allowed and given an opportunity, they actually are good workers and they toil the land um, and they work hard. And um, so, you know, I'd be happy to talk more about this measures implemented by the Soviet State because they're, they're so interesting and unusual, kind of unexpected, but. At the, this time, I would only mention that uh, because of this plethora of measures of physical integration of Jews at the workplace in the universities, and also this like consistent effort uh, from the state institutions, uh, when Jews obtained new professions, they obtained comparable income and also comparable lifestyle to non-Jews. A rapid integration happened. And here I'm giving just one example of this integration. Uh, intermarriage, which is probably one of the real measurements of integration, from 3.7% to 18.1% uh, increased among men, and from 4.5 to 15.8 increased among women, just in like 15 years time. And the scholar Benjamin Nathans uh, said, in the 1920s and 1930s, Jews were much noted presence across virtually the entire white collar sector of Soviet society as journalists, physicians, scientists, academics, writers, engineers, economists, netmen, entertainers, and more. Uh, I want to show you a Soviet poster from 1928. And it's interesting that uh, the Soviet regime uh, frequently um, fought anti-Semitism in its usual way. Um, for example, what this shows us, it shows the, the title here, the line in red says that anti-Semitism is conscientious counter-revolution. Anti-Semite is our class enemy. So the state would not allow um, one's views to be something private. It will make it this kind of views, it will politicize them and it would uh, bring the person into the spotlight and would uh, make it punishable. And one more image to show you. Uh, these are photographs from main newspapers in Soviet Union showing also um, Jewish uh, workers, Jewish tractorists, basically trying to make the point that when given uh, possibilities, they also can be hardworking, they can work the land, and um, 
here is another uh, in pink and green color is an illustration from a children's book, which I thought was very interesting to show. It was called Jewish State Farm. It was a book published in 35,000 copies. And uh, it's a curious uh, quotation that I want to share from this book. It says, Stjopa once used to tease Yasha. It won't work. You see, Grandpa Simeon says that the Jews cannot plow the land. But Stjopa's older brother, Igor, doesn't agree with Grandpa or Stjopa. So this message is an example of how uh, the authorities try to encourage young children not to look at the older generation and their uh, negative stereotypes about Jews, but to look at the young progressive youth uh, to embrace their uh, progressive message. And uh, one more image that I thought interesting to show to you. This is a brochure for school staff produced by Soviet Ministry of Education in 1929. And uh, as you see, the title is about the fight against anti-Semitism in school. And uh, this is a brochure that uh, helps um, teachers, principals, other staff from school especially pointing uh, that those who teach literature, geography, history, they should be very sensitive towards the material they use. For example, pointing that uh, writers like Dostoevsky can be very anti-Semitic, xenophobic, and cre created caricaturish um, um, images of Jews. And so the teacher should come uh, in a very uh, approach in a very responsible and attentive way and, and help children deconstruct such images. Um, now, did it matter? Did it produce a difference? And of course, <laughs> uh, I would say that it was impossible to eradicate anti-Semitism completely. And of course, this did not happen. But to an extent, it looks like it decreased the hostility that existed in Tsarist Russia uh, just like two decades before in Transnistria. And I do argue that it was because of this um, set of policies that were implemented in the interwar era. And here I have some uh, tangible um, evidence. It's interesting to see how different were perception of the Jews um, coming from the side of um, Gentile. For example, this is what the Rabians said about local Jews. Well, we got along well since the Yids were cheating when Moldovans were working. Or another frequent line was about the Jews having a better life. It's very frequent that Jews were better fed, better dressed, we Moldovans were poorer. And the really every testimony of a Gentile speaks about Jews giving merchandise from their shops for debt. <clears throat> now, uh, this, especially this last story, it speaks about a lot of tensions existing in this society. And um, uh, this tension will erupt during World War II, during the Holocaust. Meanwhile, the Gentiles from Transnistria said about local Jews, well, we were all the same. There wasn't any of this that he's a Jew and we're Moldovan, Ukrainian. If work needed to be done in the field, they called us out and them. There was no difference. Somebody said, I didn't even understand, didn't have the thought in my head that there was a difference between Jews, Ukrainians, and Moldovans. Many uh, Gentiles viewed Jews being hardworking and working in collective farms. Um, so, um, basically, since the, yeah, I see the watch and I know that hopefully we'll have some time for comments and questions. What I want to say and I want to argue here is um, I, think, I believe this lesson is much wider than just history of Soviet Union, just the history of Romanian state. 
It, interestingly, this material shows us that state citizenship and nationality policies can actually transform inter ethnic hostility. And um, uh, it can transform it for better or worse. And if a state is interested in um, improving the situation, the relationship between uh, whatever groups being ethnic or whatever minorities they have, it's very important uh, state's political will and uh, the policies, uh, be it nationality policies or whatever other type of policies implemented, they are the keys for successful outcome. And uh, from the material that I've seen and from the evidence that I've seen, I um, believe that the content of such policies is about full equality of rights. And uh, the state would need to actively persecute any public manifestation of ethnic slander. And at the same time, a state would need to construct positive images of whatever given minority we're talking about. It's also important to have physical integration through affirmative action program. And uh, it also teaches us that the issue cannot remain a private matter, but it has to be put in the center of public discussion. I will stop here. I will thank you all, you who managed to stay with me until this uh, talk, and we'll be happy to um, respond to any questions or any comments. And I will stop my PowerPoint here, and uh, hopefully you can just me now. All right, thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And I see that there are a lot of questions in the Q&A and I've kind of been monitor monitoring throughout, but I um, see a few more have come in. So let me start by asking the first question, which was that um, whether or not the PowerPoint might be available um, to interested parties after your talk. We'll be happy to share it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and so I'll start with, um, there are a lot of qu questions from Professor Bernstein, who's a, a professor of Hebrew uh, literature culture here at MSU. And so I will ask a few of his and then I'll kind of uh, move to some others and then we'll come back. So mm -hmm. um, he talks a lot, a lot of these questions have to do with uh, dehumanization of Best Arabian Jewish neighbors, participation in the massacres, um, and also just kind of some historical questions about you know, why did they deport Jews from Bessarabia to Transnistria? Um, you know, wh where did the Jewish ethnic minority in Bessarabia arrive from? And did they have Romanian citizenship? So I think some of the questions have to do with kind of the pre-war situation a little bit more um, and the different identities of people in the area. And then the last one I'll ask from him for right now is, weren't the anti-Jewish sentiments in Bessarabia very present even before the interwar period, right? Uh, including the pogroms in Kishinev. So, you know, how might that also impact this discussion? Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the last one because like chronologically it's like, yes, of course, there were a lot of anti-Semitic spirits even before the interwar era, indeed. And, but uh, what my point was that uh, uh, this anti-Semitism was not unique only to the Bessarabian area. And of course, a lot of people know about Kishinev pogrom, but it was exactly the same type of spirits were dominating the Transnistrian area. And if you think about like pogrom in Odessa in 1905, which also left between numbers debated between 300 and 1,000 victims, and then in 1881, 1882, were huge pogroms like happened in the area of Transnistria in a number of locations. So uh, was more um, contaminated by anti-Semitism before uh, the interwar era. I would say they were equally uh, contaminated by anti-Semitism, very similar in this sense. And for example, when a civil war started in Russia, the Transnistrian population, uh, the proof that it was anti-Semitic, civilian population involved in attacks on Jewish neighbors in 1918, 1921, massively. So we're talking about like tens, uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of victims. Like some scholars talk even about like 200,000 victims, you know, during the Russian Civil War. Uh, 
So in, in this sense, Romania just inherited a bad situation, but the Soviet state also inherited a very bad situation in this sense. Uh, to clarify, you know, how comparable were these two territories to start with. And why the Jews of Bessarabia were deported to Transnistria? It's a, it's a very good question. And um, uh, the response is that um, the government of Antoniescu was kind of making its own mind about what to do with Jews uh, on the go. You know, during the war, in the process, it was kind of trying to decide what to do. So initially, it was hoping that maybe it can push, you know, it was planning to push the Jews as far away as possible. This is why they, I think initially, they were not yet kind of prepared to kill them all. And uh, a really complicated question is like, why they decided to kill rural Jews? It's like, it's a question that I wasn't able to find the response in documents, in sources, and none of my colleagues, specialists of Romanian Holocaust have a clear answer on this. Like it's, uh, it's really not clear up until today why they decided to kill those in rural areas, but to deport others. But that was the initial plan to basically push them as far away as possible towards the east, kind of cleaning their own territory. Uh, and when the war did not allow them to push them further east, then they had to improvise and to find other type of policies. And they, uh, it, it was a mixed bag with some massacres, some imprisonment, ghettoization. And even closer to the end of the war, even releasing some of the Jews. So they were really trying to, to see how to act based on a number of considerations, including uh, the turn of the war. Um, what else uh, did I miss? Um, there was one about the, um, the nationality if these were, if Jews were Romanian. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, 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 thank yeah. you very much. Where did you come from, the ethnic uh -huh, uh -huh. So yeah, uh, in the part of the Jews, a big part was locals, meaning they were born and they were living here, you know, over a century or two centuries of war and depends on their locations. But because of the Russian civil war, uh, a big number of refugees also tried to flee from the war, from Ukraine. So they relocated to the Bessarabian territory. And the Romanian state reacted with a lot of hostility towards these Jews, uh, so-called Ukrainian Jews or Russian Jews. Ultimately, these Jews would immigrate further. They would go to Latin America, they would go to Belgium, Europe, United States, Canada. but uh, sometimes for a year or two or three, they will get stuck in Romania because they will need both uh, resources, financial resources, but also documentation to be able to, to travel, to emigrate. And, and during these like, years, um, the Romanian authorities were really anxious and, and, and angry and suspicious uh, towards this geographically from other parts of the former Tsarist empire, suspecting that they were spies, suspecting that they were communists, suspecting that they were infiltrated. And, uh, and because of the presence of these Jews, uh, former subjects of the Tsarist uh, Russia, the Romanian state also tried to impede and to slow as much as possible giving a citizenship to uh, Jewry altogether in West Arabia, although by the law they had to provide them uh, formal citizenship. But they made sure that each case would go through both chambers of the parliament. So you can imagine if every individual case had to be approved by like two chambers of the parliament, it took forever. And like, yeah, very few people got the right that they had it on paper. Thank okay, you so much. Um, so I have a question now from Professor.
Professor Matt Pauly, um, Professor of uh, Russian East European History in the History Department, and he says, um, the, and I'm going to read this, because this is much less familiar territory for me, um, the brochure about, uh, quote, about the fight against anti-Semitism in school that you showed is published by the RSFSR, Russian Commissariat of Education, not the mm -hmm. Commissariat. How do you see the interchange between the parallel processes of Yiddishization and Ukrainianization in the Soviet Ukraine? Did these policies reduce the likelihood of anti-Semitic attitudes? Um, that's a very good question. I, I need to kind of think about. So uh, first of all, the comment about brochure. Yes, it was the brochure of Russian uh, Federation of uh, Minister of Enlightenment, but as frequently happened, you know, it was the same as constitution. Uh, I think one prototype was produced and then it was implemented in all the republics, kind of, it was changed, you know, maybe the name of it was something. So it was widely used throughout the country, not just in Russian Federation. And the Yiddishization and Ukrainization of uh, um, uh, schools and courts and everything, if this to an extent reduced the tensions, um, I will probably need to speculate now, but if I need to make a kind of an educated guess, uh, I would say that probably to an extent, yes, uh, because um, a lot of tensions appeared, you know, before in relationship with like Russian culture and Russian language, and especially Ukrainian elites that were nationalistically minded, probably by seeing that Jews were reorienting themselves towards their own culture and supported actively by the side probably so less threat to the Ukrainian culture. Uh, and we're talking about the, probably a narrower minded group of intelligentsia that would have loved uh, Ukrainian culture to flourish more in Ukraine. And uh, of course it was a fine line, you know, how much of Ukrainian culture you can promote and where is the line where you already can be uh, accused of being nationalist in so you you should embrace you across the line and be a nationalist and be thrown to jail and sent to gulag. But uh, I guess indigenization kind of took away a little bit from this like boosting of the Russian culture, which of course was like a, a much bigger power and much bigger presence. And uh, actually a lot of parents, Jewish including and, and Ukrainian including, would want to see their kids in Russian schools because they saw better perspective in the future. So in this sense, it probably diffused the power of Russian culture and gave a little bit more space to the Ukrainian culture. Uh, that would be my guess and my response to this. But thank you. It's like a very like smart and intelligent question. Uh, I definitely would need to think. And probably somebody needs to do a study on this. Thank you so much. Um, I have a few questions that are also family oriented. I think we have some people uh, in the audience whose family um, uh, is from this area. So um, we have a question from Nigel Panic, who's also a professor at MSU. He says, "My grandparents, Hasidic Jews, survived the war in Alba Lulia in Rom Romania and Transylvania uh -huh. around." Uh -huh. Not go to the camps and went to Israel in 1948. How was this mm -hmm. possible? How was it possible? Well, um, it's very interesting. Uh, the type of the Holocaust that uh, Romania implemented it was um, in circles. You know, uh, if you can picture in your head an image of uh, the center and then the circles. You know, the more removed from the center you are. In sense, if you a Jew at the periphery, you are a really bad Jew in the eyes of the Antonescu regime. The closer you are to the center, and I mean like Bucharest Jewry, for example, uh, Bucharest Jews who are educated, acculturated into Romanian high culture, uh, the more willing was the government to kind of accept that Jewry. So because of that, Romania had a, a 
a policy of the Holocaust that was uh, like in, in, in circles. Uh, this is why uh, the periphery, Bessarabia, Bukovina, and of course Transnistrian Jews were in their eyes the worst, suffered the most because in addition to being Jewish, they also spoke other languages like Russian, uh, whatever, Hungarian, and also being communist. But uh, the Jews from uh, World Kingdom, for example, uh, Romania properly, and this is why I brought the example of Bucharest, they were not deported, they were not imprisoned. Uh, at the same time, they were put to forced labor, uh, taken into the streets, for example, to clean streets. Uh, they, uh, the property was nationalized, but they suffered in a different way than, for example, Jews from Bessarabia, from Bukovina, Transnistria, Dorohoi, and uh, the part of, Trans, you know, part of Transylvania, which the upper part that came under the Hungarian control, uh, many of them, like the majority was destroyed. But the other part that was still inside Romania did not suffer as much as other Jews at the periphery and that were viewed uh, both geographically, but also mentally, was they, they were viewed as the periphery of the state. It's a very complex model of how they were treating different groups of Jewry. And in their mind, like some groups of Jewry were more dangerous than others. Great, thank you so much. That is interesting and so different from some of the other national contexts. Um, Indeed, yeah, yeah, very unique in this sense, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a question now from uh, Professor Yael Aronoff, uh, Director of Jewish Studies Institute at MSU, and she says, were there other countries that had policies against anti-Semitism in the interwar period? Are there any exceptions to these conclusions outside of this particular study in terms of locals participating in the murder of Jews? despite prior integration of Jews or prior more favorable state policies? Hmm. I kind of like my mind got stuck with the first part of the sentence, <laughs> the, the question. And uh, uh, because like I immediately I kind of the quotations from the historian Kate Brown uh, came to my mind when she said, you know, at the time, uh, one should be honest, like that type of policies were among the most progressive in the Western world. Yeah, it's like, uh, they're very unique, actually. And uh, um, yeah, you cannot like find the same type of policies in other countries. Of course, you do have some attempts of assimilating Jews, you know, in different countries, you know, through religion, through trying to acculturate Jews, but you do not have similar type of policies uh, designed to fight uh, anti-Semitism and designed to dissipate negative images of Jews. In this sense, it's very unusual, multiple to this phenomenon, uh, including both the ideology of the Soviet state uh, strategical reasons of the Soviet state, uh, and in, including the fact that a lot of revolutionaries were of huge anti-Semitism in society, and this phenomenon should have been countered inside society. Um, sorry, so the, the second part of the question was about... It was about whether there were other... Uh, uh, examples, right? Do you see, are there any exceptions to these conclusions outside of this particular study in terms of locals participating in the murder of Jews despite prior integration of Jews or more favorable mm -hmm, policy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, since there were no other cases where similar policies were implemented, there were no other exceptions because it's kind of a, a unique case where this kind of policies happen. Mm, but mm, what I can say, um, to the point and to the question is that interestingly, in the territory under the occupation uh, and the Nazi occupation, what I see that after four years of occupation and constant 
uh, now counter propaganda propaganda that actually like they is telling you how bad are Jews and, and so on and so forth you actually interestingly you do see a, a beginning of reverse of the policies you do see how some people start to kind of unwind the process and how some people start buying into the arguments made by the Nazi propaganda machine. And you, I do encounter in the sources how already some of the former Soviet citizens, they buy some of the um, you know, rhetoric of the Nazis. They says like, yeah, because of you Jews, the war started because of you, you know, Hitler attacked everybody. So it is like, uh, ideas that were spread daily through uh, newspapers, through newsreels, sometimes like propaganda movies spread, for example, in Odessa, which was a big city, they start to penetrate society and they start to be absorbed by society. So actually it proves the point again, that if a population is for a long time, you know, treated, in a, in a way, it will start absorbing the, the message and will start some of them acting accordingly based on the message that they encounter daily. Great, thank you so much. And, and it clarifies there's some more questions later about other borderland areas that are similar. And it sounds like this really is a pretty unique um, situation, which is um, really amazing, this idea of the natural experiment. Um, so thank you for studying it and, and sharing it with us. Um, there are a bunch of more questions. So it's, it's 149. Um, they're kind of different. So I'm trying to think like, can I put them together? Let me give one. I'm kind of going chronologically from Professor or Professor Emeritus Ken Walter, who asks um, if you could please clarify the posture of Romanian authorities toward the pogroms that occurred in Bessarabia early in the war period. Were they present in egging the violence on? Were they absent and distant from the violence? In what sense the pogroms autonomous actions by Moldovans and in what sense were they perhaps sponsored and directed? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for the question because it allows me to, to speak more about these details. Um, so uh, it was a mixed bag and frequently um, um, during the pogroms both Romanian authorities were present and I mean Romanian authorities uh, army and gendarmerie, which was the, had the role of police, kind of. They were present, representing the authorities. They were frequently also the ones who would uh, execute groups of Jews. But um, local civilian population either volunteered, you know, to join these executions. We do have cases when just like groups of onlookers would follow, you know, Romanian soldiers to the execution site and say, it's like, can I also shoot, you know, somebody? Or we have cases when Romanian soldiers say, it's like, I cannot, I am feeling sick, I cannot shoot. And then the Romanian officer would turn to the audience and say, it's like, any one of you? And it's like, yeah, I want to shoot, you know? So and then you have cases uh, when groups of civilians in villages they start attacking Jews before the Romanians stepped into the village. So you have a situation when uh, Soviet authorities already withdrew. So the village is empty. The Romanians have not arrived yet, but local Gentiles, they start going from house to house, killing, beating, raping, and sometimes imprisoning Jews and waiting for the Romanians to arrive and asking, like, so shall we kill them? Other cases you have Gentiles, you know, herding the Jews or, or um, patrolling the exits from villages so that the Jews would not escape from the village. So you have a, a variety of actions and a variety of types of pogroms. Uh, was this like mix of uh, participation uh, of like, state authorities and, and civilian uh, actors, uh, either together or separate or um, in mix of this. Yeah, so it, also we do know that um, Romanian authorities also tried to instigate they had a plan, the counterintelligence had a plan, had an itinerary, 
uh, hoping that they would be able to instigate population to do their job, so-called their job of cleaning the area without their help. But interestingly, that document and that itinerary, at least from the material that we have these days, they are not the sites where most of the violence happened. Actually, in, in totally different areas, most of the violence happened, uh, which doesn't mean that, you know, maybe we'll find more documents, maybe we'll understand more. But uh, now, in the sites where the majority of Jewish population lived, they were also the site of the biggest violence in Bessarabia. And uh, uh, to just to make one more point, in Transnistria, Germans especially also tried to instigate local population. Uh, and in broader Ukraine, they tried to instigate local population. But German reports actually specifically say that, well, and the locals, they hate Jews, but they fear to act on this uh, hatred. They said, especially all the generation, they learned the lesson that, you know, Soviet authorities, um, they may come back and punish them. So the local population doesn't want to act on this. And it's impossible to hope that the locals would do our job. So this is an interesting way of comparing. And it's true that both was like um, sticks and carrots that the Soviet authoritarian state and, that became totalitarian, acted and forced its population to behave. And some of out of fear did not act. Others younger did not act out of um, conviction and also believing that you know Jews are good and their friends and colleagues and classmates and others. Uh, so for example, it's interesting, like some Jewish survivors said that, you know, when we had to make the decision, are we leaving the area or we stay behind? He said, uh, my grandparents, they wanted to leave because they remembered how the Gentiles behaved in 1918, 1921 during the Russian Civil War. Uh, they said, but we younger people, we wanted to leave because of newspapers, because what we read about Hitler and what he was doing in Europe to Jews, so uh, different uh, groups, generational groups had different considerations when uh, evaluating the situation, uh, evaluating their relationship with uh, neighbors. That's, that's so fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, oh my gosh, how many, how are we gonna do this? So there's so many more questions. I definitely recommend um, some of you that had a lot of questions, maybe to, uh, you know, uh, correspond after. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, get in touch. I'll be happy to respond and talk. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Um, and these kind of get a little bit broader in terms of thinking about, um, you know, was the behavior of Gentile civilians in other parts of Ukraine similarly sympathetic to Jews who were being hunted by the German Einsatzgruppen? And also um, questions about, uh, maybe I'll end with this one because it, it kind of goes into the future and, and thinking about how do Romanian and Russian schools teach about participation in the Holocaust? Do they hold themselves accountable and teach the history or is it you know mainly uh, taught to hold up nationalistic pride. So kind of- move I think forward. the situation is getting better in Romania. It's definitely improving. And uh, compared to 2003, 2004, when uh, you know, the whole discussion started and the uh, Elie Wiesel Commission started in 2005, and uh, Romanians uh, are finally forced to accept uh, history and uh, uh, unfortunately, it's uneven. It's a project that it's more uh, top-down implemented. So a lot of state institutions, uh, you know, promoting teaching, research, uh, providing resources. But at the lower level inside society, there is still a lot of reluctance to accept this historical truth, to, to deal with this topic. So a lot of nationalistic-minded individuals. So this is this um, misfit 
between uh, a good well-crafted policies and a lot of efforts and educational programs and you know courses at the university and schools everywhere and uh, new movies interesting that are made on this topic but um, it's not yet the population is not there yet is a, a lot of reluctance unfortunately as uh, other states in other cases when jews uh, were treated with compassion yes for sure and uh, there is a big body of literature that especially looks at the um, righteous among nations and also is trying to understand who were those people who helped Jews? And you, you have sometimes cases where in Denmark, you know, a huge group of population was trying to help Jews to escape. And uh, in studies found that, for example, in rural France, uh, uh, there was uh, some a lot of compassion towards Jews. Uh, a recent study in Netherlands shows that especially uh, among religious minorities, the areas populated by religious minorities, uh, they proved to be more empathetic to Jews. So it's interesting, all of this, uh, the body of research shows us that people who suffered themselves, who were frequently you know, persecuted as minorities, they uh, are somehow more sensitive, they uh, have more compassion towards others, and Jews including. And so it teaches us something. It, definitely, there is plenty of ground for additional research in this area, especially systematic kind of research, systematic comparison. All right, we're almost there. So much, yeah. I mean, there's two minutes left and I'll ask a follow-up about kind of the current situation in Romania. So can you talk about um, current, you know, is there a Holocaust Museum in Romania? And what about memorial sites in Romania? You know, there are, yes, finally, you know, in Romania, the situation is improving uh, with like um, memorial sites built in, in both in Bucharest, but also in Yash, for example, the site of a huge pogrom. Um, yeah, museums being built, research centers, so in this sense, situation is improving, but I want to say just the word of Moldova, which is my native country, and which unfortunately is still uh, lagging behind. And despite being in the epicenter of this tragedy, because the Bessarabia that I was talking today, this is the territory of Moldova. And we're still a lot of reluctance in like, dealing with the Holocaust, a lot of reluctance in learning about the Holocaust, and it's kind of, it's been swept away the topic. It's like, um, and again, the government uh, is somehow being pushed by international institutions in other countries. They uh, try to implement it in school teaching. And, and finally, the situation is changing a little bit, but um, compared to Romania, I still like so much has to be done, especially in Moldova, where at least Romania is moving and towards the right direction and implemented a lot uh, in a territory where the Holocaust happened and where in every village you have bones of hundreds of people buried, unmarked, uh, nothing is done. And many of the children, young people from that village, they would not know that some time, like years ago, there were Jews in that village and they were killed in that village. And that's very unfortunate. And I hope that will change soon. The sooner, the better. Thank you so much. I do think that's a, a really appropriate way to end this, especially because we are commemorating Yom HaShoah today and thinking about exactly these questions, not only of what happened, but how we continue to talk about what happened. So thank you so much for your comments, for your research. And thank you all of everybody who participated and who, and who listened in. And um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for your questions. Thank you. Bye.